Well, it really is great to be here. What we're going to be looking at tonight is the question of whether the Gospels are based on eyewitness testimony. And I want to be presenting some old and some new evidence that the Gospels are indeed based on eyewitness testimony. But I want to begin with a fellow Brit, C.S. Lewis, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, who made an argument about the person of Jesus. And he said that when we look at the sort of claims that Jesus makes about who he is, we either need to say that he is the Lord, that he is liar, or he is lunatic. Because the sort of claims he makes are so big, they can't just be written off as the words of a very great person. Because a great person doesn't attribute so much to himself. But what we found is that in recent years, people have added to those three possibilities another one, that Jesus is in fact legend. So we want to ask the question, do we have evidence that the Gospels are reliable? I want to go to a sceptical source. Uh, Bart Ehrman, one of the most famous, prominent uh, sceptics within uh, the US at the moment, a very accomplished biblical scholar, says this when he talks about the Gospels. What do you suppose happened to the stories about Jesus over the years as they were told and retold? Not as disinterested news stories reported by eyewitnesses, but as propaganda meant to convert people to faith, told by people who had heard them fifth or sixth or nineteenth hand. Did you or your kids ever play the telephone game at a party? Well, the telephone game in Britain we call Chinese Whispers. You're probably not allowed to call that over here, but that's what we call it over there. And no one, no one minds. Now, you know the way the telephone game works. It's a game specially set up in order to corrupt the message so you can laugh. So there are various rules. For instance, you have to whisper. That ensures the message gets corrupted. You're only allowed to say it once, so that ensures the message gets corrupted. You're only allowed to hear it from one person. Why should I use that as an analogy for how Christianity spread early on? I prefer the analogy of karate. Now, have you ever heard anyone say that um, karate must be becoming corrupted because it's being taught from one person to another? No, because you know that karate is uh, full of discipline and when people teach things, they teach it carefully, there are checks and balances to make sure it gets passed on. I think that's a far better analogy. But we're going to come back to this question of whether it's possible that Christianity could have begun something like the telephone game. But the first thing we're going to do is look at where the Gospels were written. Now, the Gospels, according to earliest Christian traditions there are about where they were written, generally weren't written in the land of origin, which is Israel and Palestine. I'm not making a political point when I use either of those words. I'm just talking about our location, okay? Now, according to early Christian tradition, Mark was written in Rome. Luke in Antioch, or maybe Achaia, or maybe Rome. Um, John was written in Ephesus, Turkey, Asia Minor. A late Christian tradition, three or four hundred years after Christianity began, was that Matthew's Gospel had been written in Judea. In other words, the general consensus is that most of the Gospels weren't written in Israel. We go to a modern scholar, a reasonably sceptical scholar, and he looks at the Gospels and he says, well, I think that uh, none of them were written in uh, that land of Israel or Palestine. Maybe John's Gospel began as a team effort with some uh, a group who were there uh, in uh, Palestine and then they, or Syria and then they moved uh, to Asia Minor. But other than that, basically outside the land. Or we could go to Bart Ehrman himself. He says, where then did these anonymous Greek-speaking authors uh, live? Living probably outside Palestine some 35 to 65 years after the events that they narrate get their information. The gospel writers, he thinks, were probably outside the land. So we've got a consensus, whether it's a sceptical scholar or early church tradition, that most of the Gospels uh, were written outside uh, the land of the events that they narrate. Now that's an interesting thing, because that raises a question as to how familiar they were with the land that they're talking about. So we could ask, do they know the land, do they know the agriculture, do they know the architecture, the botany, do they know the burial practices we could look into? All those sorts of things of culture. If you've never visited a place, how can you write about it intelligently? So we're going to look at a number of tests tonight to see whether these people knew about the land. 
because that will tell us whether they are potentially close to the events. If they're thousands of miles away in another country, simply making things up, well, they're not going to have any of that right sort of information. I'd never been to your beautiful um, state before about three years ago, and I just didn't know much about it. I'd heard about Texas. I didn't know it could rain here, like really seriously rain. <laughs> and, and that was completely new to me. So in other words, when you haven't been to a place, even in the information age, uh, often you're quite surprised by something when you go there. Well, think about it back then when you don't have the internet. You know, back then it was even before Wikipedia. Can you believe that? Uh, 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 and so how would someone making up a story about a country they'd never visited and they'd never met anyone who'd visited there know to write the right things? Well, I think we're going to find tonight that the Gospels are remarkably accurate um, given that they're written such a long way away. And the particular test I'm going to spend most of our time on tonight is simply what people are called in the uh, Gospels. Then we're going to look at a couple more tests after that. The test, do they call people the right thing? Well, do we have anyone here called Michael tonight? Any mics? Do you want to <coughs> put your hands up? We've got a mic here, yeah? Another mic? Now, I expected there would be some Michaels here. Do you know why? Because we can say that back in uh, the 1970s, one in uh, 25 males born in the US was a Mike, a Michael. That was a very common name. Back then, uh, Jacob wasn't such a common name, but now, uh, you, you change and you look how over from 1967 to 1997, Jacob multiplies by a factor of about 100. So what we can say is names change in frequency over time. And it's not just now, back then they did, although probably not quite as quickly as they do now. So we could ask the question, did the gospel writers give the people the right names? Imagine you had to write a story about people in France 100 years ago. Would you be able to give people the right sort of name? Well, you know, Jacques is a French name. You might know some other French names. Would you be able to get them in the right proportion and frequency? Or for any other country, for that matter? Would you even be able to do it about your own state? The sort of uh, names that people had 100 years ago. Well, people have been able to study personal names uh, recently uh, using archaeology. And there's been a study of about 3,000 names that people were called uh, back then. And we can say that Jewish names in the land of Palestine were different from Jewish names elsewhere. And yet the Gospels and Acts are probably written elsewhere and yet they've got the right sort of names. That's the remarkable thing we're going to find. They've got the right pattern of names. Let's put some more um, flesh on that. The argument began with a researcher in Germany, uh, but it's a list simply of all the names that people were called um, at the time, and so you can go through and get the information. Then along comes a British researcher, and he says, well, let's look at that and correlate that with the Gospels and see if there's any tie-up between what people were called uh, outside the New Testament and what they're called inside the New Testament. And what we find is something rather remarkable. Uh, it's a very small um, uh, chart here, not everyone will be able to see. But basically the most common name inside the New Testament for uh, males, Palestinian Jewish males, is Simon. It's the top name for the New Testament, top name for Josephus, who's a historian of the first century, a Jewish historian, top name in the bone boxes um, uh, that they had, the ossuaries, and it's the second top name in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We take the second name in the New Testament. It's Joseph, the second most common name, second most common also in Josephus and in the bone boxes. It's the most common one in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We see a significant correlation. Looking at it another way, take the two top Palestinian Jewish male names together and you find nearly 16% of men were called one of those two names. Inside the New Testament is 18%. We go and take the top nine men's names together and we find outside the New Testament 41%, inside the New Testament 40%. That is incredibly close and that is statistically significant because you, we're using a bigger data sample. As the data sample gets bigger, the numbers get closer. Now let's remember, this is a pattern that's showing up over four different writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, writing five different books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John and Acts. And what we could say also is those Gospels, those writings, reflect that sort of name pattern individually as well, although obviously the statistics are not quite so great. You don't have such a big sample. 
With women's names, there's not such a big data sample, but we can say there's a broad correlation to top woman's name outside the New Testament, Mary. Top woman's name inside the New Testament, Mary. You can say they have less imagination about what to call women, uh, but uh, <laughs> nearly 29% of women were called one of those top two names, 50% one of the top nine names, and that correlates pretty well with the 40% and 61% you get uh, for uh, those same things inside the New Testament. Bit more variation because the data sample's smaller. So we can look then at the ranks of names, and we can say, uh, look at uh, Jewish males in Palestine, and we could say, these are the ranks of the names we've got in the New Testament. And then we could say, let's go to another country where there are lots of Jews, lots of Jews in Egypt, and we find a different pattern of names. Now that's a remarkable thing. Now I've got a question here tonight, and I, it won't work in the overflow, but I, at least I can find out from people here uh, in, in the chapel. Does anyone here know anyone called Sabbatius? <laughs> no? No? No one? Anyone? Pappus? Ptolemaeus? No? Dog? Not even a pet? No? Okay. Why not? Because the Gospels weren't written about Jewish men in Egypt. If they'd been written about Jewish men in Egypt, sure those names would have become quite common for us, but they haven't. So in other words, if someone's in a different land, you get a different set of names. Now think about that again. If you had to make up that story about you know, people in France 100 years ago, would you have got the right sort of names? If you had to write um, a story about people in Egypt 100 years ago, would you get the right sort of names? You might have some vague idea of Arab names, but would you know how the names in Egypt differ from the names in Jordan, differ from the names in Syria? Uh, unless you've been in those countries, you'd have no idea. And even if you have lived in those countries, I'm not sure your intuitions as to what the most common names would be a very reliable guide. Now again, we've got another survey. We've got some surveys tonight. Uh, and one of the surveys I've got is this. Has anyone had the experience of naming a child, giving that child what they thought was an unusual name, only to find out as soon as they've named the child that lots of other children have got the same name? Okay, so we've got well, at least one here, uh, we've got another one here, another one there, another one there. Yeah, okay. Um, that's right. It, why is that? Because our intuitions as to what the most common names are uh, aren't always completely reliable. So that's something that's quite common because our intuitions are just based on a smaller data sample. So even if people were making up stories in the land, they wouldn't be able to get the names in the right proportion. Back then, they didn't have any of those magazines that told you what the most common names were. Um, you know, so what we find is this is a remarkable thing. But the story goes on. You see, it's not just that they have the right proportion of names, they have the right features of names. You see, what happens if you call out Simon? Well, there are lots of Simons, aren't there? So then we've got to do what Wikipedia calls disambiguation. You've got to distinguish one Simon from another Simon. And you find that's what they do in the New Testament. Jesus had two of his 12 disciples called Simon. One was Simon with an extra bit Peter or Cephas. One was Simon with an extra bit the zealot or the Canaanite. So you've got a disambiguation. And then you read other disambiguations. Jesus went and had a meal with someone called Simon the leper, but he wasn't a leper at the time because people were sitting around having a meal with him. Maybe Jesus had healed him. Uh, Simon of Cyrene carried the cross. There were lots of Simons around, so you better distinguish this one. Simon Peter in the book of Acts stayed with someone called Simon the tanner or the le leather worker. So you find they distinguished them. Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph. So you find that they uh, make sure that these most common names are distinguished and not the less common names. It could be adding a father's name, a job, a hometown. It doesn't matter, but you've got to do something to set them apart. Now, how could someone making up stories outside the land do that? Now, I've got another survey. Uh, anyone here find it difficult to remember names? <laughs> We've got two honest people, three honest people, four. Any, anyone else? Come on, uh, come on. No, 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 no don't, don't be shy. Any more people honest? Um, no, no, raise hands, please. You find it difficult to remember names. Okay, yeah. Uh, now, I've forgotten so many names since I arrived here yesterday, and I have been witness to five name forgetting events from other people where they've said, I cannot remember uh, this person, but I could tell you all sorts of things about them. 
You could say what car they drive, you could say how many family members they've got, you could say what state they used to live in, you know, everything. You, you, you could say about them except that vital piece of information you need in the social setting to introduce them. I bet you tonight, you're going to have, some of you are going to have that situation, yeah? It's going to, it may already be happening. You're looking around, you're thinking, that person over there, I really know their name. Uh, you know, it's just on the tip of my tongue, but it's just slipped me for a moment. I know, yeah, we had a, a daughter stay in our house for a, you know, a month. But, uh, you know, what is it? You know, names just are so forgettable. Why is it? Because usually there is no logical connection between a name and the person. So there's no logical reason for that person to have that name. And there's lots of logical reasons why that person shouldn't have that name sometimes. <laughs> so that's why we forget names. We remember things about people, but names are amongst the hardest things to remember. Stories are easy to remember, names are hard to remember. Which means that you can watch a film, and you watch a film, and you remember what everyone does, you remember what the minor characters do. Do you remember the mi minor characters' names? No. Do you even remember the major characters' names? Not always. You go away on holiday and you meet some people who are really interesting and you come back and you tell your friends about them. But you might even just drop out the names of these interesting people because the really interesting thing is to tell the story. So what we find is that names are one of those forgettable things that can just drop out very easily. So think about this. If the Gospels have correctly got the detail that's the hardest sort of thing to remember isn't there every reason to think they could get the other things right? The story bits, the who was with whom, where they went, what they did, that's easy compared with getting names right. But we're finding that they get the names right. And that, to me, suggests that we are not getting these stories fifth or sixth or 19th hand. Because if it had happened 19th hand or even fifth hand, you wouldn't get the names right. It wouldn't be happening regularly. So that just won't explain it. The only way we can get this pattern is if we have not just eyewitness testimony, but high quality eyewitness testimony. That's what we've got going on. Now I want to take this idea a little bit further. Now you've all heard, I'm sure, about apocryphal gospels and people have said, hey, what about having some other gospels in the Bible? Well, let's just look at how they do on other names. So the Gospel of Thomas, one of the most popular uh, ones that people talk about. And you look at how does it do with Palestinian Jewish names? You know, not very well. The main character is called Didymus Judas Thomas, which means twin Judas twin, which is just not the sort of name people were called back then. Um, you could look at uh, uh, another uh, gospel, the Gospel of Mary. It doesn't even call Jesus Jesus, it just calls him the Saviour. It, and it's, which Mary? We have no idea. <laughs> and then you've got the Gospel of Judas, which was um, published recently, and it's got two Palestinian Jewish names. You know, Jesus and Judas. And then it's got a whole load of people from outer space. So that, to me, is not very impressive. I don't look at it and think, wow, didn't they know the time and place really well? We could take it a bit further. Let's look at the names in Matthew. Take the list of the 12 disciples in Matthew. We find a remarkable correlation between the list of names here and uh, statistics that have just been found in the last 10 years. I have put in brackets next to a name the rank of that name for Palestinian Jewish males if it is in the top 99 names. And what we find is if it's one of the more common names, it has a qualifier. If it's not one of the more common names, it does not have a qualifier. Let's go through the list. So, Simon, rank number one, qualifier, called Peter, and Andrew, not ranked, um, his brother. So Andrew's just given with reference to Simon. James, high ranking, 11 the son of Zebedee, and John, rank five, his brother. Philip, low ranking, 61st equal, no qualifier. Bartholomew, 50th equal, low ranking, no qualifier. Thomas, not even in the top 99, low ranking, no qualifier. And Matthew, high up, rank number nine, qualifier, the tax collector. James, high ranking, 11th, the son of Alphaeus. And Thaddeus, 39th equal, low ranking, no qualifier. Simon, rank number one, the Cananean. Judas, rank number four, Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now, I know there are other things going on with that list as well. But the point is this. These statistics have only been known since 2003. You see? And what we're finding is a correlation between that list of ancient names and statistics that have only been known recently. 
That's a remarkable thing because it says to me that what we've got in this list is a, a list from Palestine. It's a list that's formed in the land. If it were made up outside the land, they would have different names. Very soon, the gospel, uh, the, the um, apostles weren't known by those uh, original names. Peter just simply became known as Peter, not Simon with the extra bit Peter, uh, the, the names actually um, develop a little bit uh, because they become more distinctive when they get outside the land. But back when we see this list, it's got exactly the right pattern for the time and place. But it doesn't just work with lists, it also works with um, dialogue. Now, one of the things about the name John is it's actually quite a common name, rank number five. So when Herod wants to say about Jesus that he thinks he's John the Baptist, uh, come back uh, from the dead, he cannot simply say to his servants, this is John. Because his servants would have said, which John? We've got several Johns that work in the palace. That it doesn't really help us. Um, so he says, this is John the Baptist. Then the narrator continues, so Herod sees John. Now the narrator doesn't need to give a further qualification because the narrative makes it quite clear which John we're talking about. The narrator goes on. And so John said. But when Herodias' daughter wants the head of John the Baptist, she can't just say, give me John's head. She might have got the head of the wrong John. <laughs> so she says, give me the head of John the Baptist. Yeah? And then the narrator immediately continues, and so he sent and beheaded John. Now you see the way it's distinguishing the way the narrator speaks from the way the characters in the narrative speak. Now that, of course, could be just a really clever literary device to make the narrative look authentic. But the cleverer you make the gospel writers, the harder it is to say they got it wrong through incompetence. Okay, so just bear that trade-off in mind. And what I can say is this is exactly the way people would have had to have spoken back then. So this could be part of evidence that what we've really got is a re report of how people spoke. Now let's uh, consider the principal character in the Gospels. You know the main person in the Gospels? I'm not going to say his name for a moment. You know who I mean, okay? Uh, now we're going to look at what that character is called. Is he called the right thing? What's he called in the narrative? What's he called by other characters? And what does he call himself? Those are our questions. Let's start with what he's called in the narrative. And we begin with looking at uh, a number of different Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And we got uh, Thomas and Judas in there. All with the main name for the main character being Jesus. The Gospel of Philip, which has become popular. It's quite a, a late thing, you know, um, maybe 150 years, 200 years after the events. Which has um, something about a relationship although the text is quite broken, which people get really interested about broken text because they can make up the bits in between. Um, and it's got something about a relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene, so that actually got quoted in the Da Vinci Code. And that just calls the main character Christ. Uh, that's the, the main uh, title. The Gospel of Peter calls him Lord. The Gospel of Mary, the Saviour. And the Gospel of Peter and the Gospel of Mary don't even call the main character Jesus at all. Now, to me, that looks like a sort of later development where um, the name Jesus has basically dropped down. That's the way uh, I look at it. We could then look at the occurrences of the name Jesus in the four Gospels. And we see uh, there on the left-hand four columns, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, with John having by far the most occurrences of the name Jesus. But we can see that some other Gospels, like Thomas, also have the name Jesus, but Peter and Mary don't at all. What was the founder of Christianity called in non-Christian accounts? Well, Tacitus, uh, writing about the, uh, the fire in Rome in the year 64, um, he said that the founder of Christianity was called Christ, Christus in Latin. Pliny, writing to the emperor about the year 112, about Christians, by the way, they're called Christians, Christ, that name really took off, uh, calls the founder of Christianity Christus, okay, Christ. Uh, Josephus, a Jewish writer, shows a bit more knowledge and says he's Jesus with the extra bit Christ to distinguish him. So in other words, the name that predominates through the non-Christian accounts of early Christianity is Christ. That's why it's called Christianity, okay? Um, contrast that with what we find in the Gospels. Look at the family of Jesus in Matthew and Mark. And we find a very common family there. The mother's called Mary, ranked number one for women. 
uh, the fathers called Joseph, rank number two. We got children, uh, Jesus, James, Joseph, and Simon and Judas, with rank six, four, two, one, and f- uh, six, eleven, two, one, and four. And if you're going to choose one to be the savior of the world, the best name with the best meaning would be Jesus, because it's got a bit of salvation in. The other names don't have that, but maybe that was just coincidence. Okay, we'll allow that for the time being. Um, we use irony over in Britain sometimes, but there we are. Okay, there are lots of ironic things about British history as well, but we won't go into that. When we look at Paul, Paul, for Paul, the name Christ predominates over the name Jesus. I've given you you in green for each of the letters, I've given you uh, the name Jesus, in blue, the name Christ. And of course, sometimes you get Christ Jesus and Jesus Christ. But the point is, for Paul, the name Christ is more common. For the non-Christian writers, the name Christ is more common. And so I would conclude that very quickly, though Jesus was the earliest name, very quickly the name Christ came to predominate. So if the Gospels were written a lot later, they might well have forgotten the name Jesus. But they correctly get the name Jesus. Groups very far removed from the origins of Christianity might forget the name Jesus altogether, like the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Mary. Let's then look at the question of what the principal character is called by other characters. Now, we've already seen um, how many words there are in the gospel. This is a, um, Luke is the longest gospel and Mark's the shortest. Compare that with the occurrences of Jesus in the four gospels and you find that John has the most occurrences of Jesus, Mark has the fewest. But hey, Mark's the shortest gospel. So let's look at that. Names of Jesus as a proportion of length, and you find that Luke has the fewest occurrences of the name Jesus, and John has the most. But that's uh, simply because Luke tends to say he a lot, rather than Jesus. Now, all I'm trying to show at that point, this is going to be important for later on, is that the four Gospels use the name Jesus differently. Why do I want to show that? I want to show that so that we can know that it's not been some conspiracy to make the way Jesus is mentioned in all four Gospels look the same way. Because they've got a very different pattern of uh, uh, naming Jesus. But what we're going to see is they also name Jesus in the same way. Look at this. Jesus was a common name, rank number six at the time. Jesus simply the name Joshua. There are other Jesuses in the New Testament. Jesus called Justice, Bar Jesus. uh, Some manuscripts for uh, Matthew's Gospel uh, give Barabbas' name as Jesus Barabbas. So it's a common name. And what we find is in the narrative, it simply generally calls Jesus, Jesus. So here we got Matthew 21. They did just as Jesus had told them. But of course, Jesus in speech would be ambiguous. So we find in speech, the crowds don't just say, hey, Jesus is coming down the road. They say, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. They disambiguate. But then, next verse, narrator says, and Jesus went into the temple. Now, the narrator doesn't need to say anything more than Jesus, because if you got up to chapter 20 of a gospel and you don't know who you're reading about, there's a bit of a problem. Yeah? <laughs> So it's obvious, you know, which Jesus we're talking about. But for the crowds back then, there were lots of Jesuses. And so we find the way the crowds speak is an authentic way that people would have had to have spoken. Look at another example. Matthew 26. Narrator says, Jesus said to him, but next thing, along comes a servant girl to Peter, who's about to deny Jesus, and said, you were with Jesus the Galilean. You know, not every Jesus came from um, Galilee. So she could distinguish this, this person. She says, well, I know he came from another place, Jesus the Galilean. A slightly more clued up servant girl comes along and says, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. But then the narrator simply continues, Peter remembered the saying of Jesus. So the way the characters speak is one way. The way the narrator speaks is another way. We go on. Pilate says to the crowds, who do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? What shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? In other words, not every Jesus has the name Christ or Messiah after him. This one is distinguished. Um, On the cross, Jesus, the King of the Jews. And even an angel needs to disambiguate. You're looking for Jesus who was crucified. Now there, we've gone through Matthew's Gospel. More quickly, we can go through the other Gospels. Same thing applies to Mark. Mark. 
What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Hearing that Jesus of Nazareth, he began to call out, Son of David, Jesus. Now, in this case, it's interesting that the narrator says Jesus of Nazareth. But, of course, he's saying that in reporting what someone heard. In other words, implied speech there. Uh, the, the point is, it's not that he heard that Jesus was coming down the road. He heard that Jesus of Nazareth was coming down the road. And so he got excited and he called out, Son of David, Jesus, because not every genius, Jesus, had their genealogy traced back to David. Or as uh, someone said, you were with the Nazarene Jesus. Or the angel, you seek Jesus of Nazareth. Going through Mark, uh, Luke's Gospel. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Jesus, son of the most high God. Jesus, teacher. Not every Jesus is a rabbi. Uh, they told Jesus the Nazarene was passing by. He called out Jesus, son of David. Now, you might think it's an exception when the dying thief in Luke chapter 23 turns to Jesus and says, Jesus, remember me. But there we are not talking about a crowd situation where you try and pick someone out from a crowd. You're talking one to one. So that disambiguation simply doesn't apply. And anyway, people on crosses don't waste words <laughs> and then we have Jesus on the road to Emmaus meets two disciples and he acts as if he doesn't know what's been going on and they say well don't you know the things that have gone on concerning Jesus of Nazareth so that's Luke's gospel we find the same pattern in John uh, we found uh, the one that Moses and the law and the prophets wrote about Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Isn't this uh, Jesus, son of, son of Joseph, whom we know? You might think it's an exception in John chapter 9, where the man who's born blind and is healed uh, is asked who healed him, and he said, Well, the man called Jesus made clay. Why does he just simply say the man called Jesus? The point that's going on here in the narrative is precisely. If you read it carefully, this man has been given physical sight, but he's not yet been given full spiritual sight. Gradually through the narrative, he comes to realise more and more. And so what the narrative is doing is in order to show that he's still to some degree ignorant, you know, he only knows that the, the, the guy's called Jesus, he doesn't know anything more. You know, he's an Australian called Bruce. I mean, that doesn't, get, doesn't really tell you very much, Yeah. Uh, and so here to show the ignorance that there's nothing, uh, there's no more detail. And then in the garden, whom are you seeking? They replied, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. That happens twice on the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So this is a pattern across all four gospels. When it occurs in speech, Jesus in a crowd situation, Jesus is disambiguated and that would have been necessary at the time and completely unnecessary a hundred years later or in a completely different setting. So here we've got the sort of thing that fits with the time and place. Now, of course, you can say, well, they were just really clever narrators, you know, narrative art, all four of them, really clever. You know, it starts becoming a little bit implausible for me to appeal to that. And the more clever you make the narrators, the harder it is to say they got it wrong through incompetence. Okay, what does the principal character call himself? One of the things about the principal character is that the way he speaks is different from the early church. For instance, he does not spend time teaching about what to do with the Gentiles. You know, a lot of the early church were Gentiles, but there's... Just no direct teaching on that. He does not teach on how to run a church service. Just as well, isn't it? But what he does uh, is he calls, uh, you know, he teaches in parables. But how many parables did Paul tell? What about the early church? Well, there's one called the Shepherd of Hermas. You know, there's a bit of a parable. But on the whole, the early church just didn't take to parables. So... The idea that the early church made up the parables later just doesn't really make sense when they're not using uh, parables later on. So it's not just that his teaching's different, it's also the way he talks about himself that's different. Because his favourite self-designation is to call himself the Son of Man. And you know what about the title, the Son of Man, is it's very rarely used not on Jesus' lips. So it's not a title that became really common in the early church. It's actually different. So we've got threefold this. The narrator speaks a plausible way. The characters in a narrative speaks a plausible way. And the main character speaks in a different way from the way people spoke later. 
To me, that comes together to say, yes, what we've got is a reliable account. Looking at the distribution of the way the phrase the Son of Man is used, we find it's very common in Matthew, Mark and Luke, the four left-hand columns. When we look at the apocryphal Gospels on the right, it can be pretty uncommon. So my conclusion is not that I can prove the Gospels are true on this basis. My conclusion is rather that the names have the sort of pattern in the Gospels that would happen if they were reporting what people actually said and did and it would be very hard for any uh, person trying to make the story look plausible to put that pattern in. It just simply is too complex. The complexity you would need for an ancient forger would be quite incredible. Now more briefly, I want us to look at some more tests. The next test is going to be the test of geography. Do they simply know the place? Well, you know, one of the things you find out is how you know, ropey people's knowledge of geography can be away from the place where they live. So I just, my knowledge of the geography of, of Texas really is pretty bad. I've got to say there are all sorts of places that are probably huge that I've never heard of. And so one of the things that we would expect to be the case is if people were writing stories a long way away, they're not going to know the names of places. Well, look at the names of places we get in the four Gospels. The most common town name is Jerusalem, the capital city. Uh, the second most common is Nazareth, the town associated with Jesus. But it's not just that you have those two known. You also have some quite obscure villages known. Places like Bethphage, a little village uh, near um, Jerusalem. You get Chorazin uh, known up in Galilee. Well, the question is this. How would someone in Syria, in Turkey, in Greece, in Italy, in Egypt, know about the names of those villages? I mean, I just can't think how they would know. In Rome, probably the best place to, to go to a bookshop. Well, if you went and bought a book about geography, it would tell you about the great places on earth to go and see before you die, uh, which didn't include Bethphage, which didn't include Chorazin, you see? <laughs> so what you find is how would people well away from the place know these things. And it's not just that they know the names of places. They know things about them. They know that Capernaum is next to the sea. They know the way where the land goes up and down. They know travelling times. All those sorts of things. How do they get that right? We compare that with what's uh, mentioned in Apocryphal Gospels. The four canonical Gospels, 12 to 14 towns each, total of 23. Gospel of Philip, two towns, Jerusalem and Nazareth. But it thinks that Nazareth is Jesus' middle name. So that's not very good. So uh, it's only really got one place correctly mentioned. That's Jerusalem, which is the capital. What about Gospels of Peter and of the Saviour? They've got one town and it's called Jerusalem, the capital. And what about 13 other earliest apocryphal Gospels? How many town names have they got? Zero. So all of the correctly placed town names in the 16 earliest apocryphal gospels and fragments, one, Jerusalem, the capital of the whole area. That to me is not very impressive geographical knowledge. But it also means that rather than being evidence against the four gospels, the apocryphal gospels are in fact evidence for the four gospels because they show what would happen if people did make up stories. They are the controlled experiment, if you like, that show what could go on another way. Now I want us to look at the number of words uh, there are in the four, go four gospels. That's the four left-hand columns, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And I've given you five non-biblical uh, gospels on the right-hand columns. Okay, I want you to fix your eyes on those four left-hand columns very carefully and look at their shape. I've just changed slide to the number of place names. This is not just town names, this is places like Golgotha, river names and so on. Did you notice the change of shape? This is the number of words per gospel. This is the number of place names per gospel. You notice this sort of big drop-off effect here. Uh, they're just not very good on place names. But there's another thing. What if we do place names as a proportion of length? What happens? Ooh. We find that all four Gospels have an amazing evenness of place name mentions. They, uh, you, I began looking at this in an English uh, version. Had someone 
uh, do a bit of research for me, and I, I, I said to her, you know, I have a suspicion that place names occur more in the four canonical gospels than in the other ones. Could you go and look at it? So she worked on an English translation, English Standard Version. She found that the four canonical gospels, between 4.6 and 4.9 place names per thousand words. That was what you wanted to know tonight, wasn't it? Uh, now, the great thing about this is you can actually do this experiment at home. Just get the electronic text of the four Gospels, uh, you know, get all the capitalised words at, at the front, uh, strip out all the ones that aren't place names, and just work it out. It's not hard. This is the sort of thing you can replicate. And what's the amazing thing is that the four Gospels have the same evenness. How are we to explain it? I've got a great explanation. Okay, this is it. Um, <clears throat> Luke talks to Mark. Mark, how many words do you have in your gospel? <laughs> Mark goes through, really carefully counting, uh, the number of words he has in his gospel. Now, by the way, uh, the uh, words were not separated in Greek manuscripts, so that made it a bit harder for Mark to count. Um, uh, but he went through very dutifully, and he counted, and he worked out the number of place names. And then Luke said, hey, I want you to find out the, the number of words, I want the number of place names, and I want a proportion. And when Luke had worked at this out, he actually created a narrative with the same proportion of place names in. Matthew and John heard about this. They thought it was a great idea that they would replicate this same feature. Um, you know, just before computing this sort of thing, people didn't have much to do before TV, and so that's what they did. Well, is that really plausible? Is it would they get that sort of pattern if they simply put in place names to make the narrative look authentic? One would put in too many, one would put in too few. It just wouldn't work out. But what if they simply told things as they happened? They're all the same sort of narrative. They're telling you gospel. Naturally putting in place names as they're relevant. Is it plausible that if their narratives are long enough, they would have roughly the same proportion. That, to me, seems a more plausible explanation. It's not that they have the same proportion in every passage. Matthew 5 to 7, Sermon on the Mount, no place names. But over the narrative as a whole, we find the same um, concern for geography, not in a way that sort of is intrusive, that's trying to give you extra details you don't know. It's just trying to give you some relevant details. It's about real time and space. That, to me, explains what's going on. I've got another test. It's the test of botany. Now, does anyone know the story of Zacchaeus? Yeah? Little man. Yeah? Do you know what sort of tree he climbed up? Sycamore tree. Can, any, can anyone sing that for us? Uh, you know? Yeah. Anyone? Can we do this together? Zacchaeus? No, no, no. Okay, we won. Um, right. Okay, more difficult question. This is the next level. Um, what town was he in when he climbed the sycamore tree? Jericho, we got an answer from a few places, it's great, you're a good audience tonight, fantastic. He was in Jericho, and that's in Luke's Gospel. So the question is, what's the question? What's the question we're going to ask? Are there sycamore trees in Jericho? The answer is, you bet. You see, look here, there are some guys in this sycamore tree in Jericho. You see that? They are standing in Jericho. Now, how could Luke know that? I have two possibilities, three possibilities, but let's start with the first two. One possibility is he went to Jericho and he saw there are sycamores. The other is he spoke to someone who went to Jericho who saw there are sycamores. The third possibility is aliens from outer space told him. But I'm going to discount that third explanation. There may be others, but let's just focus on those first two. Those first two seem to me the most worthy of consideration. What we've got is this is the sort of thing that people who've been to the place know. Now, if the Gospels are getting this right, they're not just getting it right on place names and names and plants, they're getting the shape of house right, they're getting the shape of the temple right, they're getting the coinage right, they're getting the social stratification right, they're getting the religious setting right. After a while, you think... There are so many opportunities for them to go wrong if they are making it up. So many opportunities, and they don't seem to go wrong like that. 
The other thing we can say is that sort of sycamore tree, Ficus sycamorus, where did it occur? Well, I went to the most authoritative source of all, Wikipedia, uh, and, uh, but I, I, this is the modern distribution, but I checked it's also the same as the ancient distribution. There are no Ficus sycamorus in Turkey, Greece, Italy, you know, it's there, Syria, Palestine, Egypt. You know, in certain countries, the narrator couldn't even have heard of those things unless he'd actually talked to someone who'd been in the land. So this is the sort of thing that fits very well uh, if the narrative is true. I want to bring some passages, uh, some tests together uh, for a look at one uh, narrative. There are very few things that occur in all four Gospels. The Passion narrative, of course, the triumphal entry, but the miracle that occurs in all four Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. Now, I can't prove that a miracle occurred. Okay, no one can prove that a miracle occurred, but we can ask this. The narrative about the feeding of the 5,000, does that come from close to the alleged event or from far away? That's the basic question we're going to look at and see what's the case. Let's start with the numbers. Well, how do you count 5,000 people? Well, you know, have you ever been to one of those uh, church or Christian events where they sort of wildly overestimated the number of people in attendance? Uh, that can sometimes happen. So the question is, could that 5,000 just be some disciple guesstimate? Well, there are a huge number there, and so on. Well, what you find is that both Mark and Luke tell us about the counting of the people. Mark tells us that uh, Jesus commanded them to sit down in groups on the grass, and the groups were by hundreds and fifties. Luke says there are 5,000. He'd said to the disciples, have them sit in groups of 50 each. Now, if you've got 12 disciples, uh, uh, that, and 5,000 men, that's less than 100 groups, that's about eight groups each. Do you think the disciples could, you know, could count up to eight a tax collector, fisherman, you know, it's the sort of thing they probably could, you know, one, two, three, many is the way some students work. But uh, no, I, I think they could have done that. that. That would have been a task that would, they would have been up to. But then we look at the uh, narrative in a bit more detail. Um, what we find is that Mark and John both comment on the grass. Mark tells you there was green grass. John tells you there was much grass. Now, the question is, is that just a detail that's made up to make the story look authentic, uh, or is it real eyewitness detail? But Mark tells you there were many coming and going, but he doesn't explain why many were coming and going. But then John tells you it was Passover time. Now, if I put those two things together, one explains the other, because at Passover time, people, of course, travel to Passover. Okay? So what happens is... The one explains the other. Lots of people would be traveling at that time, and so Jesus calls his disciples aside. But then in John's Gospel, Jesus turns to Philip, and he says to Philip, where should we buy bread from? Why does he turn to Philip of all of the disciples he could have chosen? The Gospel doesn't say. But then in John's Gospel, we find that Philip replies, and then Andrew replies. Why? The Gospel doesn't say. But Luke's Gospel tells us that the feeding took place near Bethsaida, and John's Gospel tells us that Philip and Andrew were from Bethsaida. Now think about that. If I read through John's Gospel on its own, I see no significance whatsoever to that. They are just simply isolated bits of information. They don't fit together. If I plug in that information from Luke, suddenly the thing makes sense. Jesus turns to a man with local knowledge and asks him where to buy bread from. That man and another man get involved in the reply. That makes complete sense. Even the little detail in John that the, they were barley loaves fits exactly with the time of year when you've had Passover because you've just had the barley harvest. But we want to ask the question, would the grass really have been green? Well, let's go to a precipitation chart from a nearby town. <laughs> and we find from Tiberius... Uh, we, we, can, we can say, uh, when would the uh, Passover have been? It would have been roughly around then for any of those years. We've just had six of the greatest months of precipitation. Would the grass have been green? You bet. So in other words, all of these things come together. And they build, uh, to, for me, uh, a narrative which looks believable. It looks credible. This is not something that's been made up well away from the place just as stories were related. Now, some people want to have this idea that the way 
um, miracles about Jesus were attributed to him was a gradual process whereby people just exaggerated and through exaggeration, through many different steps, they va- gradually got to this idea who'd pe- of a guy who'd performed many, many miracles. One of the things that's so striking about miracles of Jesus is that so many miracles are attributed to him, that they are so undramatized, and the fact that even the opponents of Christianity, whether later Jewish opponents of Christianity or later pagan opponents of Christianity, did not deny that Jesus performed miracles. They simply debated the source of the power of Jesus' miracles. So there's a whole load of miracles attributed to Jesus. So how could that take place? Well, some person might say, gradually over time, people exaggerated the accounts and so... Miracles got attributed to Jesus. The problem is, there are so many miracles you'd have to do that for. And the other problem is, the sort of process, a a, a telephone game process that would corrupt things like that, doesn't corrupt information selectively. There's no way you can have lack of attention to detail on the question of whether a miracle occurred and huge attention to detail on all the sort of minor uh, issues, incidental details surrounding that. It just doesn't work it's far more likely that you're going to get the um, main bit preserved correctly and the minor details correct. So get this, if the Gospels have correctly got the minor details, isn't it reasonable to think they could correctly get the major ones? So for me, this forms an argument that, yeah, we're really dealing with something real. Can I prove it? No, I can't. There's, a, there's an answer to all of this. Someone can push back and say, yeah, there's a weak point in your argument here, here, here. I'm not going to deny that. There's always an answer to everything doesn't mean the answer's right. Okay, but if the Gospels come from a conspiracy or through the incompetence of storytellers that simply got details wrong, this isn't the pattern you'd expect. If the Gospels were the product of something very removed from the events, it's not what you'd expect. So I could think of the Gospels as like, and and, and the way they uh, act is like a hurdle race. There are many, many hurdles they could fall down at. Any one of those local details, they could have got seriously wrong. And yet they're consistently getting over those hurdles when we see other literature fall down. In the Bible, there are two talking animals. There is the proverbially stupid donkey that gets it right, that's Balaam's ass, and the proverbially clever serpent who gets it wrong. Okay? Now, I'm sure there is a sermon in there. Um, Maybe let's inspire David for tomorrow. Uh, You know, he's looking for that inspiration. (coughs) But I think this is also the way there are two explanations people tend to use for Christianity. One is to say that the early Christians got things wrong through bungling incompetence. They just weren't interested about the details, they were so airheaded like religious people often are, and so they just got the details wrong because they, you know, they weren't paying attention. The other explanation is the conspiracy theory one that says, hey, they were really clever and they made it all up in this really authentic looking way, but it's not really authentic. You know, what I want to say is those two explanations are fundamentally in tension with each other. It's not that I can't ever combine one bit of one with one bit of another. Yeah, you could do a bit of that. But basically, they're two different ways. And what we can say is, why not just take the middle route? The Christians are neither particularly stupid nor particularly clever. They're just ordinary guys, regular Texans, who are saying what they think really happened. Thank you very much for listening.